Hello, my name is Steve Forrest, and I'm here in Chesapeake, Virginia, to learn about the Battle of Great Bridge that took place here in December of 1775. Today I'll be attending a reenactment where I'll be portraying a British sailor, a crew member of the HMS Otter. Crew from the HMS Otter actually fought in the Battle of Great Bridge with the British in December of 1775. So join me today as we explore the history of the Battle of Great Bridge. Now they're going to come up and try and reinforce. The bridge you see behind me and the canal were not the original Great Bridge. The canal did not exist in 1775. The canal was dug in the 1850s and the bridge was put up across the canal much later. The actual Great Bridge is actually located down the road a little bit. It's a small bridge and most people drive over it without even realizing that they've crossed the actual Great Bridge, which was the scene of the Battle of Great Bridge. Where we are right now was actually part of the American lines during that historic battle. So let's go into the reenactment and learn more. Not very accurate. In other words, if I, that's one of the reasons that you want to be very careful. That's one of the reasons the British got very upset with the Patriot. Because all the British officers wear courgettes and only a few of them. Good morning, sir. Working on getting lunch going now. Yes. Peace boards today. Very nice. Well, we're in the uh, British camp of the HMS Otter, and uh, but our uniforms don't look anything alike. That's because on the HMS Otter, the men weren't provided uniforms. Only the officers had their own uniforms. So the men basically wore just what they wear. So that's why Andy looks different than I did. Yet we're both members of the crew. Indeed. Actually, I did get thrown this pair of workman's slops, which I have to work off. Just as being aboard ship, the newest member of the crew, they throw me one piece of gear they happen to have lying around. I have yet to fashion my own because many of the things that I wear and I use as my own equipment and my own dress, I have to make myself. I just haven't quite finished making up everything else at the sail campus to make some new ones, so I'm in these for the time. And so what you find is after a cruise at sea for a while, they start to look alike because they buy a lot of material to make their own clothing. Mm -hmm. And some are steadier with the needle and thread than others. So you'll have one person aboard the ship who's going to be a little bit better and possibly turning out something for someone else in exchange for a grog, a good knife, maybe a few wads of powder. So the HMS Otter was actually here at the Battle of Great Bridge, weren't they? Indeed so. Yeah, the Otter's man, the great guns of the fort. Very they good. Were like two six pounders. So they basically dragged them on shore and brought them to this uh, location. I just give an understand. The soldiers brought them, and then they brought the sailors to man them. The sailors marched in with like a mitch, at the least a midshipman. We don't know if anybody higher than that was in command, but a midshipman wrote about it. He said I was, you know, honored to be among them, and they came in and man We came in the night before and manned the great guns in the battle. Oh, very nice. Indeed. Well, thanks, gentlemen. And you? He's filming. <laughs> <laughs> to the uh, cannoneer, the cannoneer puts it in the barrel, the rammer reaches over, rams down the cartridge, pulls the rammer back out, turns around and stands there, and look where they're standing. Even with the mud hole. Now, is that safe? Well, depends on what you hear again or not. Usually, though, if the gun was a little bit larger, you would stand right in between the wheels, right next to the barrel, and lean up against the back. The... Didn't roll the cartridge tight enough. We didn't get a smoke gun. But if you... All right. It's rolling now. All right, we're here with uh, Brian and uh, Matt from the HMS Otter reenactment group. And 
I'm going to have them explain to you how to fire our swivel gun. All right, guys, okay. we'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, this is about a one-inch swivel. It's a uh, standard type swivel used uh, for small boats, boats, and actually a board ship on the gunnels uh, for the, the, the repelling boarders or for taking out uh, for an anti-personnel type of weapon. Uh, loaded with shot, uh, basically. Uh, and the first step is like a small piece of artillery, so you want to search the piece first. Go ahead and search the piece. And that is clear for make sure there's no wadding down there. And then the next step would be to swab it. Swab just to make sure there's no uh, burning embers down there. And then now the next step would be to uh, we're going to prime. Actually, I need another cartridge for priming. But, uh, sorry. We're going to pour the cartridge down the barrel. And this is loose powder. All the powder down the barrel. I'm not going to put the wadding down the barrel. Tap it a couple of times. Put our support in place. And we're using another cartridge. This will be a priming cartridge. And at this point, we're going to prime. Vent hole here. All right. Now it is primed. The gun is ready to fire. And we'll take our lint stock. Yes, I take care. I have to make sure that it is glowing nice and red. Have a care! Fire in a hole! Huzzah! He fires a gun. And that's how we do this work. And, and the guy in the back of the gun is louder to them than it is the guy standing right next to it. Now. Hello, I'm here with uh, Mike from the 7th Virginia Regiment, and he's going to tell us a little bit about why they fought the Battle of Great Bridge. Uh, why they fought it. Uh, well, it's neat to be here on the historic ground that we're on, uh, and why it was fought is because it was, uh, this area, uh, in, which has essentially always been called Great Bridge, um, once the bridge over the marshy area was built, uh, it's one of the few access points by land from the south to Norfolk. So in other words, if you're trying to um, either ship supplies, get them into Norfolk, not, I shouldn't say ship, transport by land, you have to essentially go through this area. Uh, all around is part of the, I assume it's the Great Dismal Swamp still, it's, it's shrunk quite a bit, but there's it's swampy area. In fact, much of what you see behind us would have been all swampy area. The canal wasn't here, of course. It was, uh, it was maybe a creek, but the real river is about 300 yards further down the road. Uh, and so what happened is Lord Dunmore, trying to establish a base of operations out of uh, Norfolk in 1775, realizes in order to secure the area to the to the north of here, there's about 11 miles from here to, to Norfolk. He wants to keep, to keep that area secure for forage for the for horses, things like that, like that. Um, so he needs to defend this choke point. And so I think it was in November of 75, he builds a small fort, which no longer exists, exists but it's on the other side of the Elizabeth River. And uh, we kind of know the location of it. And so that he's got he's to man that fort and control access uh, across the river. He actually takes up the bridge. And then um, in Williamsburg, the Virginians who are forming their own army after mm -hmm. the, after uh, well, there's already been bloodshed at Hampton and then bloodshed at Kemp's Landing. They send um, Colonel Wood William Woodford down with the 2nd Virginia. There's two Virginia regiments. 
Uh, the first under Patrick Henry stays mm -hmm. in Williamsburg, but the second comes down and it takes them a while to get here because of supply issues. But they arrive, um, actually the advanced elements arrive in late November and then Woodford joins them right about now. I think today's December 3rd, so he would have been here by now. And they set up a breastwork on the other side of what is now this, this uh, drawbridge here and it's a standoff for about a week. And right. so neither side dares to push the other side uh, at that point, simply because the carnage would be too great. But there's a lot of skirmishing up and down uh, at other po crossing points of the river. And even around here, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of firing all day long. Mm -hmm. So that takes care of why we're here. Um, now what happens is... Down there and shoot it off. The Linstock person is waving that little Linstock at the top. She's putting it over near the thing. Okay, get ready, fire. I just know how they turn their hand. Direct the cannon crew. Boy, I think that's the way. Actually, this bridge and the, the original bridge, there's some little island. And that's what they're stopping. Handle cartridge. Prime. Shut pan. Cast about. Load cartridge. Shoulder, fire locks. Make ready. Take aim at the left oblique. Fire. Handle cartridge. Shut pan, cast about, load cartridge. Make ready, take aim at the left oblique, fire. Your, your All right, gentlemen, that was great. Uh, so, tell me the difference in these guns y'all have here. This is a, a rifle, 50 caliber rifle, uh, patterned after Pennsylvania um, weapon style. Uh, Rate of fire, approximately one round per minute. Um, because of the rifling and how you've got to load it, normally you would be loading from a horn into a uh, powder measure. These are goat horns, uh, 60 grain and 130 grain. Because you don't load from the horn directly because if you still got burning embers in here, that's a one or two pound grenade in your hand that would ruin your day, definitely ruin your hand. Um, you charge the weapon with powder, have a piece of linen, get a ball from your bag, you hold it, get out your patch knife, cut it off, get the ramrod out. These are wood, so you can't grab it at the top because it'll snap, and so it's, it's very laborious down, 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 a couple inches at a time. And after numerous firings, the barrel gets fouled from unspent powder, so it gets harder. Um, and then you bring it up, charge, the, you know, prime the pan, and you're good to go. Uh, the musket, that's a best second uh, land pattern, 
75 caliber, rate of fire three to four uh, rounds per minute. Uh, it's a smoothbore, think of a shotgun, basically. Uh, the ball is a 73. Yeah, yeah. Smooth. it's a 73, so it's smaller than the, the barrel, so it pretty much drops down. The loading process is pretty much the same, other than you prime, because you're using, he's going to be using a cartridge like you just saw. So you rip it off, charge the pan, close the pan, cast about powder, paper and the ball all go together, ram, and because it's so much smaller, you can not necessarily really have to ram it, just you know, tap load, just get everything seated. All right. You can do that, you know, three times a minute, where I'm taking a, a minute per, you know, per round. Accurate 50 yards, 250 yards with a rifle, um, and if you let your opposition get close to you, and if they've got muskets, they can also fix the bayonet. So they've got 18 inches of steel. I can use this as a club. And after that, he's got the reach on me. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna run. You know, unless I've got a lot of, you know, extra riflemen, you know, shooting pairs, you know, you're working pairs, so one's loading while the other one's shooting. Mm -hmm. You know, and keeping an eye out for the opposition. Well, thanks a lot for the gem demonstration, oh, guys. No, uh, not a problem. I'm Steve, what's your name? Dave. Dave? Phil. Phil? Greg. Greg. Well, nice to meet you, gentlemen. Nice, nice to meet you. Fordyce, Captain Fordyce. He's the commander of the uh, Grenadiers, and they want to What really happened then is that... Hmm. Now... Dunmore's been telling his people don't get caught by those cold pepper militia guys because they'll catch you. You'll see what happens at the end of this battle. I'm here with James. He's one of the reenactors at the Battle of Great Bridge. So uh, tell us what you are here. Uh, I am a uh, British grenadier with the 14th Regiment of Foot. Um, the 14th Foot is here at the Battle of Great Bridge. And the grenadiers are here. Right here behind us is the, the uh, British Fort. It was built here about about a month ago by John Murray, the royal governor, and Earl. Yeah, who? No. How do you call it, John? I'm sad to report that I am a monkey python. Film him. No, no, don't. Film him, ma'am. You're in our set. Oh, really? Yeah, you're in our set. Yeah, we got the dice out there, but that's all right. She didn't care. Okay. Well. <laughs> That's all right. All right, so uh, so what's with the uh, big hat you got here? What's that? What's with the hat? The hat? Well, you see, we're really friendly to people when they come by to visit us. So when, when they come by, we just act like the grinner deer that I am, which is not very friendly. <laughs> and being a sailor, same thing. Right. The grinner deer hat is a miter cap that was worn by the soldiers of the army, uh, the grinner deers. Grenadiers were the tallest and the strongest, and they were selected out of the regulars. And so, this is a um, miter cap uh, with bear skin on it, and commonly known as the uh, well, people call it the bear skin cap today, but at the time it was called the miter cap or the, or the uh, it has the uh, patent on the front of the cap. Mm -hmm. So, Fort Murray that's behind us. Uh, this was built right down the road from the actual Great Bridge, wasn't it? Yeah. For his heroism and what he did, and to honor another soldier, even though he's the enemy, they gave him a full honor military unit. or six people in line, and we step up, fire the one on the outside, and go back, reload while we're running to the back of the line. Now, why did they stop there and not go back into the fort? That artillery piece is more valuable than a whole company of troops. So they're going to defend that piece right now because that's the one thing that we don't want to attack if we're going up the middle of the field. So what did happen? What happened here um, on December 9th, there's a little bit of, um, of um, 
I wouldn't say disagreement, but we're not we're not a hundred percent sure why Lord Dunmore attacked like he did uh, when or when he did. But the bottom line is he de he he decided to try to force the rebels out. Um, you got to remember that. I mean, what, behind us here, we've got our mm -hmm. ramsackle uh, kind of breastworks that we make out of hay bales. But what he um, what he was really going up against is is uh, a breastwork made out of logs, pretty secure. And then behind them was a was a was an American encampment. Uh, they were using the town, the little village of Great Bridge. So there are homes. The officers were staying in the homes. I'm sure there were tents uh, set up and all. But this was essentially the the, uh, the advanced post. So Dunmore's plan on December 9th, um, he had gotten word that reinforcements for the rebels were coming with cannon, and his stockade fort couldn't couldn't stand up to solid shot. So he wanted to kind of solve this situation right now by by attacking before the reinforcements came. Uh, his plan went awry though, because one of the detachments he sent in the attack either didn't understand the orders or didn't receive the orders properly or weren't properly led, but they were supposed to cross down river and then get come in behind, work their way around and uh, be a diversion, mm -hmm. drawing the Americans southward, their attention southward. And then the British, the 14th Regiment and, and the Otter, a detachment for the Otter and the Ethiopian Regiment, um, part of them, uh, we're supposed to just literally march and overwhelm the, 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 the small guard detachment that was there. Well, the diversion didn't go off, so the, uh, the attack shouldn't have happened, but Captain Leslie decided to, to do the attack. See, Dunmore wasn't here. He mm -hmm. wasn't actually in the fort. Uh, so the attack takes place. They march down this narrow causeway. Um, you'll probably get a shot of, of it. We've got it roughly kind of um, marked out with... with, uh, with fence rails and his men marched right into the into the face of the American um, guards and were pummeled wiped out um, estimates are of a hundred a hundred or so men that actually uh, did the attack well he lost 30 men right off the bat I, uh, hey, and his, his officer that led the advance charge was found with 14 wounds, um, yes, uh, from from the from the fight so he lost the cream of his crop. The, the 14th foot, they were the professional soldiers and he lost a good portion of them. Um, there's more to the fight than just the British marching up and being wiped out. One of the reasons they took so many losses is they were packed on the causeway and they couldn't really maneuver. So right. they were, it's like a fish in a barrel thing. But there was also a lot of fighting that took place distance wise. Um, we've kind of got the island set up over there too. Um, so there was a lot of long range and, and Dunmore's men had cannon so they were blasting away, but they, I, I think we, the the rebels, had one man wounded in the thumb. That was the extent. That's pretty incredible, that only one man. It is, it is. Of course, of course they're, we're, we're protected by breastworks and all, so um, we have that, and they're, they're standing out there in the open. So mm -hmm. it's, it's... That we can hear. So you don't want to kill the only guy that they can surrender with. So that's why we don't shoot non-combatants. Now, in the movies, these guys would be running, right? Y'all saw it in The Patriot, that last big battle. They're running across. No. This is controlled. The first command is march. The second command is march, march. And notice they put... That's right. And that's a big target, isn't it? It's in the right spot. And it's shiny. He's crossing the battlefield. And he gets shot in the leg when he goes down on one knee. Stand back up. Boys, and they keep marching. He goes a little further, he gets shot in the leg again, he goes down again, he stands back up, and he says, rally boys, we're going to do it again. And he keeps on going. When he gets within just a few feet of the barrier, he kills. And when we found his body, he had 14 bullet holes in him. Okay, now, as they advance up, these guys get all loaded and get ready, and they're holding their fire, because these guys are doing what they're going to do. They're going to try and push through that thing, right? So they're going up there. And watch what happens.
Remember I said that we're 60 across plus four ranks deep. 72% of them are killed on that one volley. And they keep pot shot at them as they're going back to make sure that they're, so some of them are wounded and they're trying to get back, but they, they keep knocking them down. Look at this 500 over here that's going to run up through here and going to run through that hole. They're still standing over here. And a lot of them are moving around behind the floor. You got to remember, they were civilian Tories. They're not your army troops that are getting those kinds of commands. Stand up, get in line, and start marching forward with your, just your bayonet. Not the weapon's not loaded. You just shot it. Now you're going to walk up there with a frog sticker on the end of it. Oh, it's a now the Culpeper militia is kind of neat. Although they get four dice up here, I'm the one. Nope. They get Captain Fordyce up here and they, point, he's got 14 bullet holes, but what's happened is they're retreating back. See where that line is, and as they're retreating back from there, they're shooting across the causeway and they're picking them off off the bridge and stuff as they're going. Up. That's why they're still shooting. Now, not as surprised. I've heard this story of William Flora. Oh, Billy Flora, yeah, yes. They do a good job at the uh, Yorktown Museum of, uh, of, of highlighting that, and we try to we try to replicate that too. Billy Flora was a, a militiaman, uh, African American militiaman, um, uh, here at the battle, and and he happened to be on picket duty with his, with several others. And what happened is, in the in the night, at night, the Americans would post sentries, almost like listening posts, mm -hmm. and then at dawn they would typically withdraw them, and then over the course of the day there would be no man's land, and all. Well, on the on the morning of the attack, because the British were hoping for surprise, um, before the pickets had been withdrawn, they started repairing the bridge so they could they could cross the bridge because they had taken up all the planks. They just had the runners on the bridge, and the pickets heard it. They they heard the the, the noise and they fired. Uh, and, and warning shots. Now, for most of the Americans, they've been shooting all week, so this was not anything to get alarmed about. Um, the pickets all fled except for Billy Flora, who stayed and fired, they say, I, I think six shots, maybe even eight. Um, he didn't all stay in one spot. He fired, withdrew, reloaded, fired, withdrew, um, and came back and he was the last man back and so by the time he, he got back it was very clear something out of the ordinary was happening now still the men in the uh, up in the camp I mean up in the in the main town they still weren't aware of it because they didn't see it but the ones at the fortification now knew oh we're, we're under attack and what's interesting is you know, Colonel Woodford's in command but he doesn't actually get involved in the battle uh, until the, the, the tail end. Most of the heavy fighting happens in the, in the early parts. So there's that a lieutenant, I want to say Travis, who's in charge of the guard detail. And it's him and his like, 70 or 80 or 90 men that did most of the, um, or, or uh, committed, what am I trying to say, uh, did most of the damage to the British mm -hmm. in the attack. And, and, and Good morning, and everyone. Welcome others to joined the battle soon after. Bridge, Sunday. Okay. Now, aboard a ship like that, she'd probably have eight guns on a side, and you talk about that hitting our little guys out nothing else, but you know, probably eight six pounders. They can tear up uh, an outfit really quick. We'll have to see what she's doing. Went her there, he pulled his trigger, and it didn't go off. 
that's, that's a misfire. If he pulls the trigger and he gets a puff of smoke. If I took that musket and I wanted to go buy parts for that musket, what's that wooden part called? Anybody know what that wooden part's called? Stock! Right out of trees, you know, 10, 15 feet apart. I ain't making any control. Hear the whistle? That was one of the few things. You hear drum beats, if you have a drummer with you. You have drum beats. If not, most officers carry the whistle. And it means certain things. One blast, blast two, or three blasts tell you different things. Okay. Now these guys are falling back because of that ship out there. They see that ship's maneuvering and stuff and realize it wasn't just sailing past and they don't want to be there when it, when it do its thing. Now they're doing individual fire and the reason for individual fire is so you keep a rate of fire going all the time so that the enemy doesn't, I mean, I don't want to stand up and charge when people still shooting at me. Uh, if they fired a volley, then they're all empty and we can be loaded. That while they're loading, we can charge them. But if they shoot individually, then you, it's all part of the tactics. But they all have brown vests, so they're, they're going to fire volleys 90% of the time. But over here, they'll fire individually because we have a lot of home rifles, muskets, stuff that we brought in the woods. In fact, some of these are Culpeper Militia, which are all armed with rifles and they're sharpshooters. 